Before this video gets started, I wanted to let you guys know that there's only a few days left in the 2015 LML Duramax giveaway. Yes, that's right. Just a few days left. And right now, we're running double entries. Plus, we have the new Benchmark T available front to back print, 6040 poly cotton blend, everything that you guys love, but they're in limited quantities. So just think, this t-shirt or anything else on the site doesn't get you one but two entries, and it could be your winning ticket to win that truck. Seriously, guys, don't waste any more time. This is our biggest giveaway yet, and it could be you taking it home very soon. Let's get into the video. Beads on beads, buddy. All right, guys, so this is the first wash after Forge Drake did the whole ceramic coating. I'm super excited about it, and I wanted to show you guys, well, Caleb's holding the camera right now from LRA. We already kind of tested it here, but look, see all these bugs? Generally, you'd have to sit and scrub and scrub and scrub. All we have is a power washer and minimal effort. Check this out. It's like a magic eraser. That is just so sick. Yeah, that looks really good. It's way better than clay barring. Oh my <laughs> God, so much better. And everything's just beating up, rolling right off. It's gonna make cleaning so easy. I'd almost have to invest in like a small little air hose now just to hit this thing so I don't even have to wipe it. Yeah, that looks really good. It's kind of crazy, like once you ceramic coat something, you really never want to deal with any paint that's not ceramic coated because of how easy it makes cleaning. And trust me guys, like I love cleaning my vehicles, but when it comes to like, the redundant process of washing, scrubbing, cleaning, and then the exhaustion that comes with it. Having this is like complete spoilage, and honestly, I can see why a lot of people do it now. It's like bug be gone. Water just runs right off. All right, guys, here we go. First official wash on the 2020 with Forge Motorsports coating. I think this should be a pretty cool experience. God, that is just so satisfying, is it not? What Iverson, baby. We are on that total paint match game. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna talk about everything with the 2020 Denali that everybody needs to know that most people probably don't wanna talk about. This is a video that we're gonna go into all of the little things that are, quote, disappointing about this new truck after I've put about 2,000 miles on it in my ownership. Now, quick disclaimer before we go into this, I wanna say that I'm extremely grateful for being able to own a truck like this, a brandy spanking new truck from the factory that I quite literally bought with 36 miles miles on it, and I don't regret anything about buying this truck. Rather, I wanted to make this video to showcase just about some of the things that don't really live up to the standard of what is a pretty expensive truck. And I don't necessarily care about throwing numbers around because I think they come off as kind of braggadocious and I don't ever, ever want to be perceived that way. Obviously, all the pricing information for these trucks is available online, and you guys can kind of make that connection yourself. Now, before we jump into those observations, I think that anything that we talk about in today's video is widely apparent and really applies to any brand new vehicle today. All these manufacturers have transitioned away from this very sturdy materials to obviously lighter, more fragile, more frail items, if you will, to well, save cost and lighten vehicles and kind of help in aerodynamics and fuel economy and blah, 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 blah. It's an increasing trend that we're all seeing in late model vehicles today. So obviously what we're gonna be pointing out on this isn't just to bash GM or the 2020 Denali or any of the HDs in general. I'd say that it applies to every new vehicle in one way, shape, or 
for a form. And also, before we do that, I just want to give a huge shout out to Forged Rick. He is the individual that did all the ceramic coating on this truck. It turned out absolutely phenomenal. This is the first truck I've ever had ceramic coated, and I'll tell you what, it pays off big time. Not only dollar for dollar, but dollar for dollar in the sense that, yes, it protects the paint, but dollar for time in the sense that, well, time is money. The cool thing about ceramic coating is it cuts down on wash times literally by 75%. I love washing my vehicles. I love keeping them clean, but I'll tell you what, the redundancy and monotony of scrubbing bugs and scrubbing dirt and then having to dry every little nook and cranny so water doesn't stick and then create water spots is very draining. And I don't really necessarily enjoy that. And I think a lot of you can attest to that as well. Cleaning a full-size truck is very difficult, but ceramic coating makes it a lot easier. Just food for thought and initial impressions of mine as this is my first and only currently ceramic coated truck, but I can damn near guarantee that I will be ceramic coating more of my vehicles as we go forward. It is so, so worth it. So Rick, thank you so much. Guys, by the way, it is not a paid advertisement. This is just me looking out for a good buddy of mine that does some great work. Now, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We are going to be making a ton of content with this truck as it goes through its life cycle of modifications. What we've done to it thus far is a set of 24 by 14, some 33, 14 and a half Fury, some paint match fender flares, some tint, and the ceramic coating, and that's about it. But there's a lot more in store, so if you guys are excited about seeing a brand new late model truck get modified, tap that subscribe button. And my OGs, I just love you guys so much, and to everybody that's new to the channel, thank you all so much for deciding to, well, join. And joining is completely free. Mind you, it's not gonna bite you in the wrong way. It's it's good, we're friendly here, we're friendly here. But in all seriousness, guys, let's start talking about some things. I don't have any chronological order to this list, rather it's just things as I see them and as I've experienced them. The first one I noticed today on the exterior and the first one that comes to mind is the mirrors. Now the mirrors, I actually really like. I know, unpopular opinion. What I don't like though is as I was drying them, I noticed that there's a really loose trim piece. Like, I mean, come on. General Motors, this is disappointing. Down on the bottom, you can see how it moves around. And that over time is just gonna get looser. This one up top is good, but the side piece is loose. Another thing I noticed as I was drying the truck, and again, this is just the immediate thing, is that trim piece also isn't secured. I mean, putting a little bit of 3M tape or double-sided adhesive tape isn't difficult. And guys, again, on a very expensive, brandy new truck that was just re-engineered from the ground up, you'd think that little things like that would be addressed. Next on the list has to do with the chassis. Now I'm not gonna touch it because I don't wanna ruin the coating, but on these new trucks, we were hopeful and optimistic and we had some wishful thinking that GM would change up their frame coating. Their dipping procedure sucks. This stuff dries out. It's like a tarry substance and then it all flakes off. We were hopeful that they do some sort of electroplating process to where the coating was actually chemically bonded to the metal of the frame, but they didn't. I guess this is cheaper, easier. They don't wanna retool manufacturing. They don't wanna put R&D into that new process. So it's still the same completely crappy frame coating. That kind of sucks. Another thing is good luck keeping the tailgate clean if you want to do one wipe dry. That doesn't exist because traditionally you just have some of your water collection points here around the trim, but now we've got this whole second tailgate area that is just going to collect water like crazy. And as you can see, it actually has a little bit of a pool here because this is elevated and so is that. So water will collect that doesn't run out and through the tailgate. Kind of a little bit of a bummer. Obviously the one big thing that I think most people are aware of is the multi-pro tailgate that's offered on these trucks. It offers like, I don't know, six-way adjustability or something like that. There, there, there. Uh, you have a little handle if you want to use it, but clearly there's a problem with the engineer that did his quote engineering. See, there's the water right there. I was telling you guys. Because, well, you put it down, you hit the button, and if you have a trailer hitch in your receiver, you are screwed, my friend, because although this truck has 15 cameras that they brag about, the two cameras on the back don't serve any functionality to detect if there's something in the hitch. I mean, come on, guys. Tesla's got automatic driving cars. General Motors didn't have the ability to think through that. I think the engineer needs to be heavily scrutinized about that because a lot of people that buy these are actually business write-offs and they're using them as they're intended to do. I tow a gooseneck, so I'm not so much worried about it, but people that marry the receiver and the hitch 24 seven, that's something to totally be concerned about. You could easily be forgetful. You're on the move, you hit that button and well, come to find out you have a dented tailgate. And I really don't want to know what the cost of that tailgate is. Most tailgates probably like around $2,000. That one's probably way, way more because it has way more stuff. Another thing that I think is 
as questionable at best as General Motors' decision to integrate mud flaps on the rear and on the front. The front ones are not on because I needed to take them off to clear my 24s. I do have full turning radius at the moment, so it was completely worth it. And if you buy the paint match factory flares like I did, it doesn't come with paint match built-in mud flap things. Kind of a disappointment. Now getting back to the mirrors as I think in a completely disorganized fashion about things. We've got our loose piece. Now we have a turn signal on the outside and forward facing cargo lights that are pretty cool. I like them. I like the forward facing turn signal as I think it ties together a lot of the exterior as you're notifying the people in front of you that you're turning. But it was nice from a driver's perspective to have the turn signal here in the mirror. Those mirrors have it on the old GMs. The mirrors on that LML over there have it, but they decided to get rid of it here. And honestly, as a driver, yes, you had the notification on the dashboard but it was always nice to know, flick the turn signal, look left, look right, and see the flashing light for you. It's kind of just like a nice reminder that no longer exists. I don't know why they would pull that off. Another questionable decision on the exterior is the location selection of the engine block heater. It is nice, it is convenient, and I can see why they'd put it there because as you're walking to your vehicle on either side from front to back, you'll be able to see that you have a cord running out. So it's very visually apparent but it looks kind of weird in my opinion. Personally think that it would have been way better suited here in front of the truck next to the tow hook. Imagine that little flap there, it would almost blend into the shadows rather than just being in the valence. Now, one way to combat that is to grab the valence off of the 2020 Gasser, the 66 Gasser HD, which will fit right up and in. And I believe in the aftermarket, it's only a matter of time before somebody offers a relocation kit that you can tap, delete, and then relocate. That's gonna be pretty nice. And it's definitely possible because the wiring comes from right there. You can actually kind of see the loom. Well, you probably can't, but it's right there and runs across. So there will be enough wire to go to the opposite direction. Just another little tidbit in my opinion. So getting into these trucks, steps are definitely required. And personally, I like them because it allows me to actually step up into the truck rather than sliding onto my seat. You slide on and off of these bolsters a lot. They quickly flatten out and they just look like crap. I like to try to preserve my trucks as best as possible. I know that some people would prefer the form over the function, but I prefer to kind of have both. I don't think they look that bad. Plus when running wide wheels, they act as a first line of defense to catch any debris that might be getting slung at the rockers. Now that's just in this case of the wide wheels, something to consider. But GM, come on guys, like this is 2020. On the Platinums, they've had automatic folding steps for years and they're old trucks. That's a 2017 and it's equipped with them. This is a 2020 and they're not. I mean, that's a totally questionable decision that really sets other manufacturers completely ahead. I mean, we're talking like field lengths ahead in terms of competition. Now the Rams can come with factory fold out steps as well. It's those little tiny thought out decisions that can sway somebody's decision to argue that this is a truck that's best in class for everything, performance and comfort and convenience. Just in my personal opinion, definitely a missed opportunity. Now let's jump on into the interior. I'd say that a lot of people that are considering buying one of these trucks weigh out the importance of the inside. And to be honest with you guys, I have no arguments. I don't. Like I said, as we're talking, my big disclaimer is I love this truck. I'm so grateful and so blessed to be able to have this thing and to be able to say that I own one of the first 2020s that was around. But there are some things that if you were to compare to other manufacturers that would make you kind of question why. So let's jump on inside here. First things first, the eight inch touchscreen display. It already looks dated on a brandy new truck. You compare to the new Rams and without saying anything at all, you guys already know what I'm going to talk about the ram screen is absolutely colossal compared to this one it's a little bit bigger than that of the lml which is the truck that one of you guys is going to be winning very soon and don't get me wrong it's a very nice screen it does its job it has everything that it needs compared to some of the legacy trucks but again if we're comparing 2020 to 2020 or any current late model i mean come on now another thing is like this blank button here in the middle what is that why would anybody just leave a totally blank button and personally if you wanted to fill up a little bit of real estate here just to make the lack of info payment option less apparent, you'd think you'd fill out this space a little bit more, but they didn't. They decided, I guess, simplicity is bliss potentially. I mean, everything is nice to the touch and feel. You know where you are, you know that everything clicks, but again, it's kind of just a question as to why. So we'll fire this thing up. Push button start is nice. I 
do like that. Center console storage area has been significantly reduced. Here you have a cell phone charger and a tiny little cubby where I keep a lot of my business receipts. That's it. You do have a deep center console, but who wants to constantly open and close when you're on the fly? It's nice to kind of just drop and go. In the old trucks, there were rows for storage that no longer exist. Now, where they did subtract, they did add, they put this little compartment up here, but you don't want to keep chapstick up here. You don't want to keep gum up here. You don't want to keep anything that doesn't want to get blasted by the sun up here. So yes, it's there, but it's not really as functional as something down here that you could keep some things that were, let's just say perishable kind of covered. So the cameras are cool. It's got all these cameras when you're driving. It only lasts eight seconds before it disappears. I hope somebody comes out with a flash to where we can make that stay on forever because it is kind of cool to keep these on when you're driving, especially when I'm towing my gooseneck trailer. I like to watch, make sure everything's connected. I like to keep an eye on just kind of all the perspectives. Now, GM says, hey guys, we have 15 camera angles and you can install two accessory cameras, both in your trailer and behind your trailer to see your cargo in your enclosed if you want to, or behind And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, that is super sick. I have a 25 foot gooseneck trailer that I tow and I'm very good at navigating it, but having the ability to have eyes completely behind the trailer is nice because you wanna ultimately optimize your space and back up as close to something as possible. And then they argue this transparent trailer thing, which is right here. Well, come to find out, guys, if you get the few thousand dollar camera package that gives you all of these perspectives, accessory cameras, marketed everywhere by General Motors with this cool transparent feature, and even has its own little locations for them, don't come with the truck. As a matter of fact, I haven't even looked up the cost of those yet, but let's check it out. Go to gmc.com. Oh, and if you want to get added cargo space and organize your center console, you can always get one for uh, 65 bucks. So let's see here. Oh, you can get bigger mud flaps. Thank goodness we know that. My arm's getting tired. I don't even know where these things are. You think you can back up a bit so I can squeeze No. Okay, we're still looking. This is ridiculous. Uh, Category, electronics, trailering, cameras. Okay, those aren't even it. All right, guys, no joke. Uh, these trucks have been out for probably about a month now. They're starting to get increasingly more popular on the road. And uh, for a few Google searches in about 20 minutes, I straight up can't even find them. Generally, like a Google search is easy enough. But I did find the 2017, 2018 Ford trailer mounted camera that would go on like a platinum like that one. And that one's about $286, so call it 300 bucks. So if you want to get two of them, and let's just say the assumption is that they're 300 bucks by GM, you're looking at another $600 to be able to use a function that GM said is included. So when I bought this truck, I'm like, sweet, can't wait. We got that little package right back there. And I'm like, all right, cool. I open it up and I see the block heater, but I don't see the other camera. So I called the dealership and I said, hey guys, I think you forgot something. And they're like, oh no, no, those are sold separate. It's just like a kind of disappointing shake your head moment. So I will be getting them, but it kind of sucks that you have to buy them. So this truck does have Apple CarPlay and it has this cool swipe feature to where you can see what's playing and your map. But when you go into Apple CarPlay, you can't use that feature. You can still see what's playing, but Apple CarPlay will not automatically come onto this screen. This is the built-in GM GPS, which we all know sucks ass. And it's completely unusable because once it's updated, it's updated in stone and it doesn't ever update going forward. Whereas Apple and Google Maps updates continuously with what would lead to headache when you're traveling. Now, heated and cooled seats are great. Uh, I'd say that they're mediocre at best. You hear a little fan kick on and the seat does start to get cold, but I did try the heated seat the other night. It does get warm. Same with the heated steering wheel, which gets warm, but I wouldn't say it gets like hot to what you want as that refreshing heat. It will heat up and it will get warm and it is nicer than nothing, but I'm curious to see how it does in the winter time. Now over here, you have functional buttons to scroll left, to scroll right, but these arrows don't work. They're just fake buttons. You have to use this scroll thing and to click, you kind of have to click in. Now I get it, it's kind of cool. You know, it's active, interactive, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes when you go to click, it'll scroll. It's just not natural when you're trying to go between a button and a cruiser. Info heads up display is cool, but when you're wearing polarized glasses, it's practically impossible to see. Life through polarized lenses is better than non-polarized, but not if you wanna use your heads up display. So over here is where you can control your lights, auto, non-auto, um, and then you've got your fog light button here. So you think that like on the old trucks, this is your fog light button, but it's not. It's actually a button that controls the lights on the front of the mirrors, as I had mentioned. They're like forward-facing cargo lights. Then you've got your rear cargo lights that tell you that they're on and off, but this doesn't tell you if they're enabled or disabled. You just kind of have to guess at night. And what happens is, as you click the button, you'll see it has a few modes. I'm clicking the button right now, so we'll start off. All right, so hit the button once. 
nothing happens. Sorry, we're gonna start off now, so hit the button once, both come on, hit the button again, the right one turns off, but the left one stays on. Hit the button again. This one turns off, but that one turns on. Hit the button again, and they both turn off. It, it's so confusing, and it doesn't tell you that. It doesn't notify you, hey, look, your left forward cargo light is now enabled, and then disabled, and then enabled, and then off. Another really weird, not well thought out lighting related feature is this button right here. If you can see, it's automatic high beams. Pretty rad, right? I like that idea. When you have your headlights on, up in the top left corner, you'll see, well, I guess it's not working because it's light out, but what'll happen is that'll be on, and then when it goes to the automatic headlight feature, which detects oncoming traffic and will turn it off, there's a little green automatic high beam symbol that goes right above the light for the headlight indicator. For some reason, it's not working right now. But what I'm getting at is if you have your fog lights on, which is also identified as the fog light thing right there turning on, and you go to use this, it will not turn on. I was sitting here clicking it when I first got the truck, and I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I know that that's the automatic high beam function, but how do I know that it's working and I have the fog lights on because generally you can't drive with the high beams on and the fog lights on at the same time. They have to switch on and off. And if you have the fog lights on and you hit the high beams, it turns the, the fog lights off and on as I click. But the automatic high beam, you have to physically turn off the fog light button, then click your automatic high beam button and it, it doesn't do it automatically. So the automatic high beam will not work if your fog lights are on and you have to remember to turn, oh, my fog lights are on. I have to turn them off so then I can turn on my automatic high beam functionality and it's like, what? Like that to me is like a holy crap. How did you not think about it? I don't know. And, and these are the little things that I wanted to talk about. I'm getting heated. I'm not actually heated, but it's like mind boggling. These are the little things that I don't think anybody would ever actually pick up on while they're doing their test drive because they get so excited. They're like, oh, hell yeah, new truck. This thing's sweet. 10 speed Alice and automatic transmission, which is very nice, by the way. And um, they would never see that. So just an FYI. Now, another thing is the lack of customizable dash. The only thing that's customizable is when you go into trailer mode, you turn this Left. You'll see up in the top right corner, the gauge will actually change to transmission fluid temperature. And then if it's off, it'll go your battery voltage. That's it. Whereas on the second gen LMLs and the first gen L5Ps on the Denali, everything was digital and it could be customized however you wanted it. Why would anybody get rid of customization? If you put the time in to create customization, you'd want to just keep and maintain the customization because a lot of R&D goes into that. But now it's gone. Why? Another thing is the shifter. This is similar to the old shifter, but different because it doesn't have the tow haul button and it's like totally plastic. Whereas the old ones, the, the second generation style shifter, they were actually wrapped in leather, which was pretty nice. And then as you can see, when it comes to gear shifting, you've got your five indicators on the right, part, reverse, neutral, drive, low, and then in the middle too. So there, there, there. So if you're trailering and you're towing a super heavy load, sometimes the TCM is not the best at identifying what gear you want to be in, at least on the old Alice in a 1006 speed. So I would frequently go into what used to be called M, but now it's L, and then I can see what gear I'm in. But what's strange is you can't see what gear you're in otherwise because it just doesn't tell you. There's no way to identify. Now just this one? Yeah, now you're good. And now that one's off, right? Now yeah. here, go film that one. Yeah, it's off. On? What's it blinking for? There's four modes, That's and it doesn't really tell you. Weird. So it's, I don't know where they are right now, all on, then it's one side, then it's the other side, then it's off. But it doesn't notify you. See, that's your fog light button. Yeah, that's super weird. Why did, and nothing comes up? Nothing informs you. Yeah, so you can set it to just one side, another side, or both, but you'll never know, unless it's dark out, which ones are on because it doesn't tell you. Now, rank as you will, but I'd say that that's one of the most confusing things. Another complaint within reason, I can't complain too much because this is the first truck I've ever owned out of a lot of trucks that has a sunroof, which I absolutely love. By the way, it's so nice to have a sunroof and the sliding room window in together because they work well together. You can open this and open that and you have a really nice free flowing air stream that constantly kind of drives right by you rather than this like muffled feeling of the windows down. And when you have the windows down, it's just this free breeze. It's not like there's back pressure or anything. So it's very nice. Sunroof size, questionable at best. It's nice. It lets a lot of light in for the driver and the passenger up front, but compared to competition, it's nothing to write home about. Did just validate though, as a matter of fact, that this sunroof is bigger than the sunroof that came in the previous generation truck. So fun fact there. Then we got the back seats. So I don't really have complaints. There's a lot more storage space. They do have this kind of included cargo bin 
in. I do not have the all-weather floor mats yet from the factory, but I did have them ordered. And another thing that they do is they actually make you take this box out and trim it here because currently it makes contact with the bottom of the carpet. And if you went to put the all-weather floor mat in, which covers the whole back area, it will not fit past here because it kind of goes up and through here, through the bottom. So you actually have to take this off and cut it. You literally have to cut this to get it to work. It's not like they have it pre-pressed to where it kind of just snaps out. You literally have to cut it. So um, that's kind of interesting. Other than that, I never spend time in my back seat for obvious reason. So I don't really have anything else to say for that. But there's a lot more cargo space, that's for sure. Now, being that I basically just mutilated and blatantly attacked everything about this truck, you're probably thinking, well, those are a lot of make or break things for me and in my ownership. And again, I'm not being endorsed by GM or GMC. If I was, probably have a lot more, well, I don't know. I have a, a lot of their trucks already. I'm not trying to, maybe that sounds really bad. What I was trying to say is that they're not putting any money in my pocket to, to reinforce this point. And I'm not saying this to try and justify the fact that I bought it. Again, I'm very happy that I did. But what I was trying to get at saying here was a lot of the things that we had talked about later on in this video are, are more than likely to be updated via like a flash or like a, a, a bulletin. So if anything is part of like a birthing defect with some of these trucks, GM posts these bulletins and then they can update them. So the likelihood that like the electric stuff that I showed you about like the high beams and then the front lights not notifying you and maybe even the tailgate I have reason to believe that they'll be able to create a code that would give you the ability to update those things so they work as desired it's maybe those little things that were maybe just missed in the big process of introducing a new vehicle so I wouldn't say that those should be make or break items as I have a very high degree of confidence that they're probably going to get updated now some of the other things such as the running boards or the sunroof like maybe that could be make or break for you I don't know but personally I'm super happy with the decision that I bought this truck and it tows like a fierce animal. It's super smooth. The 10 speed transmission is awesome. It rides extremely well. It's a much bigger truck. So it really gives you more of an increased road presence personally at night. And even during the day cruising down the road, this truck looks absolutely beautiful. And honestly, it really does offer a lot. But the whole idea of making this video is to introduce and educate any potential buyers and any other just ongoing viewer of the things that nobody would ever really pick up on. Uh, you definitely wouldn't pick up on these things when you took the truck out for a test drive because you're probably all hyped up and you're trying to see how the 10 speed shifts and how it feels and your visibility points and all that kind of stuff. And other than these little quirks and features, as our boy Mr. Demuro would say. Now, as I'm on my way home, I nearly forgot one last talking point. So I had mentioned to you guys that you have the drive indicator and then the L indicator, which gets you into manual. I don't know why it's an L. I don't know what that stands for. But regardless, when you're on the highway and you're driving and you're in 10th gear, let's say at about 70 miles an hour, it puts you at about 1300 RPMs, which is awesome for fuel economy purpose. If you shift into L, it'll immediately throw you into seventh gear, no matter what. I don't know why. I don't know what gear I'm in right now. So here, let's see. All right, so here's 10th gear. If we go back up and then we go down, it throws you to seventh gear automatically every single time. For anybody that's ever trailered anything in the audience, you know that using the manual mode is actually very helpful, especially with stock TCM tuning, because sometimes the transmissions can be a little laggy. They don't really have the best response. In this instance, the 10 speed really isn't that bad. Like it's actually very sensitive, which is super reassuring. Like good job there, GM. But still, if you're in 10th gear and you're trying to like lug up a hill, maybe shift down to like eighth gear. It's crazy to say shift down to eighth gear or like ninth gear, for instance, just to get that little extra bit of horsepower at the top end it immediately goes to seventh now i believe seventh gear is a one-to-one -one ratio gear so maybe that has something to do with it where the engine and the trans are spinning at the exact same revolutions per minute i don't know but i still figured that was something that really kind of caught me off guard and almost kind of took me by surprise when i shifted in the manual mode when i was on the highway for the first time again i really wish that you had the ability to see what gear you were in like i bought my wife a 2019 jeep jl unlimited in that you can go into the selection screen and you can decide whether or not you want your gear indicator visible or not. Like, I don't, I don't know why they couldn't make that an option. In the Fords, I do know that you can see what gear you're in at any given point in time. Kind of strange. Now, if there's anything that I said that I contradicted myself on, or if I made a point that maybe I didn't inform myself on fully enough that actually is available, guys, please let me know in the comments below. I'm not perfect. I'm just kind of flying at the seat of my observations here. And the last kind of interesting observation here is that the camera is actually really distorted when it doesn't have two perspectives. This is a 1080p camera camera, but when you can see the full screen, it actually looks like everything is warped. It's really hard to use. And honestly, I don't depend on it at all. And it's extremely inaccurate. But when you go to cameras, it's proportional, which is just really bizarre. It's very usable. But again, when it's single, it's not. So probably another update that we'll see coming on these trucks, hopefully very 
soon. So now that we're back in White Truck Nation, I'm about to end this video. If you guys haven't grabbed yourself one of the Benchmark Tees front to back print, which is an exclusive for enthusiasts, go ahead and do so. Plus, right now, this shirt could get you not one, but two entries for a chance to take home that 2015 LML Duramax. That's the truck that started my channel, and I'm gonna give one of you the opportunity to take it home. It might just be you. Imagine that. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and you're running out of time extremely quick. This giveaway ends September 3rd, 2019. Right after Labor Day weekend, it is gone and gone forever. So if you want a chance to take that beast home, here's your opportunity. Plus, these things are limited, so get them while they're hot, because once they're gone, they are gone forever. And I get requests all the time, like, hey, Jack, can you bring the shirts back? I'm, I'm sorry, guys, we can't. That's the exciting part about limited products. So anyway, my like that you love you guys, do what you do best. Tap that subscribe button if you haven't already. I'll see you all in the next episode. Chase cream, so we feed it to the children. Paint new faces on the canvas as I write classic poems like Sanskrit.